Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Bart, how are you doing today? I'm well. Good afternoon, Peter. How are you today? I'm super fabulous. We've got a great guest on the show today. We do. Uh, Dr. Scott Morrison is going to be joining us. Um, Scott is... He is the uh, a pioneer in the world of equine podiatry, and the things that he's been able to change here um, have bettered the lives of veterinarians, horse owners, and especially the horses themselves. So I'm real excited to have him in here today. Yeah, I agree. And uh, Scott and the podiatry service that he has built and the people that he has um, helped foster make such a difference to case management. You know, with what I do, I get these really sick horses, and we get them over the primary problem. And I don't want to have to lose them because of what happens yeah. to their hoof. And the uh, guidance that they give us and the management they can add to the cases within the hospital has just made the difference between these horses leaving, going forward and having dignified functional lives and us having sometimes a euthanasia situation. Right, right. And these guys are experts, right? This is hard for – to get the level of expertise that they've got, it's, it's hard for a practicing veterinarian to develop, be able to develop that and give these horses the case management that they need. Um, and what they've done for equine podiatry is unbelievable. It's it's a little bit like what uh, basketball was with the peach baskets compared to the NBA today. They've just moved it along so much. Yeah, so and much. I'd look on these guys as the superstars of veterinary medicine. Oh, yeah. so I, I agree. I don't, I don't know of another advance that I've seen since I started practicing that equals the advance that uh, Scott's made with equine podiatry and our, and our podiatrist, not Scott alone. but Yeah, yeah, and generally. And it's, there's so much science involved. But it's such an art form as well to watch these guys oh, yeah. work. Like I just want to sit and watch these guys work and just, you know, how they just look at things. And so it's, it's really the epitome of an applied science. Yeah, I agree. So, so, two, so two things. We're going to take a – we're going to give Scott the opportunity to take a bird's eye view of this today. So if you're listening to the show, watching the show, and you want to hear Scott talk about something specific, um, just leave it in the comments section either on the website or uh, the YouTube page or send us an email. So – Yep, oh, great, and I would emphasize that too, is that if there's something out there that interests you, get hold of us, and we'll get Scott back and make sure he tells us all about it. So, uh, yeah, I think it's yep. on with the podcast. And, and lastly, one other thing, I, I've been admonished to do this. If you like the show, please uh, follow us on YouTube, or is it uh, Apple Podcasts, right? Apple Podcasts. Uh, give us a like. I don't, I don't care if you like the show or not. Follow us. Like the show. But, Hit the button. But who wouldn't like you, Bart? <laughs> There's so, I can give you a list. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a long one. So uh, welcome to Stallside. Why the podcast? Root and Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy has a relatively small marketing budget, especially when you compare us with our competitors. I understand that marketing is important, but telling people that you exist and what you do and why your products or services are different is a must. I thought about what makes us unique, and I realized I wanted to give people something of real value. And that's how the podcast idea evolved. I wanted to use the money we had set aside for marketing, not to tell people who we are, but rather to show them, to open up how we do things and give something of value at the same time. The content of this podcast is designed to do exactly that. It's not going to serve as a shameless plug for pharmacy products or services. We want you to know who we are. That quality is uncompromised. That we care about people and their animals. If there are specific topics that you would like us to cover or guests that you would like to hear from, please email us at stallside at rrvp.com. Hope you enjoy the show. Just one more note. Nothing that we talk about here today should be construed as veterinary advice. That's why you have a relationship with your own veterinarian. Thank you for listening. Scott. Welcome to Stallside. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Dr. Morrison. Glad to have you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I was uh, born in Long Island, New York. My, uh, my father was a mounted police officer, and my mother managed a uh, thoroughbred training farm and galloped horses. And, you know, we grew up in a horsey kind of family. You know, my parents both rode in the rodeo in Long Island. You'd be surprised to know there was a rodeo in Long Island. And both competed. My mom competed in the hunter jumpers, and my dad competed with uh, western uh, reining and, and roping, a little bit of everything. That is so, actually quite surprising for Long Island, New York. Yep. And you yep. said your mom competed in hunter jumpers, not associated with the rodeo, though. No, 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 no. Now, when I was really young, we, uh, there was a, a rodeo in Long Island where my parents, uh, we kept horses there with our fairgrounds, and they both, my mom did like an Annie Oakley kind of kind of halftime show, and my dad, my dad did some calf roping, 
And then uh, when I was younger, my parents got divorced, and my mom went off and took a job at a uh, thoroughbred training uh, farm in Long Island, New York. It was quite a big farm for Long Island. There used to be a lot of farms in Long Island. It's changed a lot since then. But it was kind of a horsey community where we grew up. Gotcha. Yep. So what's the radio now? Is it a, is it a Walmart or what is it? I, it's something like that, yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of sad to drive past there. It's all yeah, it's all built up and gone. Yeah, yeah. urbanization, not always a good thing. Okay. So what drew you to podiatry? This must be a long story. Yeah, well, I've always... I mean, I've always been fascinated watching farriers work, you know. I've always enjoyed when they came to the farm. They were always uh, quite the characters when they came to the farm. I thought they had a cool job. You know, they, they got to bang on steel and, and, and hang out in barns all day and, and just and shoe horses. And it's always interested me. I've always been fascinated by the process, um, you know, how they can help horses. And, and, and just, just the, the work of it all just really interested me. And then, you know, I've always been impressed with the veterinarians when they came to my farm as well, you know, and I've always looked up to them and we always relied on them. And I thought they were just really neat jobs. You know, you spend your day in, in barns and working on horses all day and just look perfect to me. So I always had the idea of wanting to do both. Mm -hmm. So you had some farrier experience before you became a veterinarian though, right? Yeah. Yeah. I went to horseshoeing school in 1989, 1990, around there in, uh, in Martinsville, Virginia, Danny Ward's. That was when I was uh, starting undergrad as well. And then I started my own shoeing business in Blacksburg, Virginia, and you know, shod for probably six years before I went to veterinary school. And then went to veterinary school and, and continued shoeing horses up, uh, up to the second year. I, I realized, you know, being a student <laughs> with those, everyone in my class was very smart. And when you're on the curve, <laughs> I realized I could not shoe horses and yeah. study. I mean, it was, it was a, I had a rude awakening the first year. I mean, the very first yeah. test I took in uh, veterinary school, I got almost the lowest grade in the whole class. I remember it was embryology, and I was, I was shoeing horses, you know, a lot. I had a pretty good business, had nice clients, and I was, I was trying to keep it all going. Yeah. And that first test, the next day, I called all my clients, and... I had to stop shooting. <laughs> I had to be. I had to get serious about <laughs> being a student. Yeah. You know, undergrad was. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah, easy. That's, that's school was a whole another whole another can of worms. Yeah. So. so, of all the places you could have gone with your uh, experience shoeing, and your desire to actually do a little bit more as a veterinarian and apply that to podiatry, what brought you to Lexington, Kentucky? Yeah, well, the caseload and the number of horses. You know, I also had an idea that maybe I wanted to be a surgeon as well. You know, so and I had a lot, you know, the good thing about veterinary medicine, there were so many options. Now, I could do podiatry, I could be a general practitioner, or maybe do surgery, whatever. So I came here to, to get surgery experience. I took an internship in-house with the, with the surgery and medicine. And uh, it didn't take me long to figure out I, I, I didn't really want to do surgery. I, mean, I liked watching the lamenesses, but I really wanted to be out in the field. Uh, working on horses and I really liked I really missed shoeing horses and I wanted to combine both things you know I always joke I want to you know I've always felt like I've been grooming myself to be a, a great veterinarian my whole life you know and I figured I would I would start at the foot and slowly work my way up <laughs> to all the body systems and someday be like a James Harriet just to be a great all-around kind of vet and yeah. still you know, on the foot though right yeah. 21 years later I'm still on the foot so <laughs> stuck at the co Stuck at the coronary band. <laughs> yeah. I haven't made it, haven't made it to the fat log yet. So. Yeah, well, I mean... I think this is where I'm going to reside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, to the benefit of all that you have stayed there. So um, who are your influences um, that drove you to podiatry? Because this is a very specialised thing, and it's a very small pool of people. So who are your influences, and what did you draw upon to get to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, I mean there's really you know, through undergrad, and there's really no veterinarian except, you know, Dr. Redden was the one we'd see, you know, reading in the magazines and, and you know, really just his magazines and his articles. There wasn't a whole lot of internet or anything else back there to see or videos. But, uh, so I always, you know, always read about what he was doing. I was always very interested. Um, I did have some advisors in veterinary school, like uh, Scott Pleasant was a, he was a trained farrier as well as a surgeon. So he kind of, he was an influence as well, I'd say. Um, but I would say it was just mostly farriers I met along the way and veterinarians that really, really kind of made me make up my decision and, and really influenced me to do both. Shoeing a horse is a very hands-on, almost artistic type of thing. But with what you're doing with podiatry, you're actually bringing a lot of science. Where is the science 
where where is this recorded? Who was doing the work? How much of it was actually out there when you began? Because you've had quite a storied career at this part, a point, and we look on you as somebody that's leading this. How did you build your foundation of knowledge to get to where you are? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of piecemealing together a whole bunch of, you know, every piece of information you can find. You know, there, there's always, I feel like there's always been a disconnect between research when it comes to podiatry. I and mean, there's a lot of research out there and, and facts if you find it, but then implementing it and bringing it into, the, into practice, I feel like there was always a big gap there. I mean, there was always, there was farriers and veterinarians and there were researchers. I feel like it wasn't really all coming together. So, I mean, that's, that's something I've really tried to focus on throughout my career is trying to read as, you know, just try to get as much information as I could from reading, you know, any kind of uh, scientific journals, anything. I, I would just skim through the, uh, you know, the glossary or, or the uh, first couple pages of journals, make sure any, any foot stuff, I'd save it, photocopy it, read it, file it. And I would try to just make it all, you know, put it all together slowly over time. So what did you pick up? I mean, especially from the, the deep archives, is there is there stuff way back in the history that, you know, maybe had fallen out of favor that we're, we're using now today? Oh, yeah. There's, there's, I mean, a lot of the shoeing modalities and shoeing techniques and even the treatments we've used, you could look far enough back in the old old veterinary textbooks or old farrier, the old farrier textbooks. Um, and you can find a lot of the shoes we use nowadays, you know, back in the old days, back in the 1800s, 1700s. I mean, you look far enough back, you could find almost most of the shoes we use now. So, I mean, there's, there's really a lot of information in the past that I think kind of maybe got forgotten about. You know, I, I, think, I think, you know, years ago in veterinary school, there was a lot of, there was a farrier emphasis. And I think somewhere along the way when, you know, when horses weren't used as much, they kind of fell out of the curriculum. A lot of the farrier science and foot science fell out of the curriculum. And I think a lot of that knowledge was somewhat lost to some degree. No, that, that, that's a good point, and and because horses are used different now than than they were before, I think a lot of that has has fallen out. But talk about because one one thing that fascinates me is uh, I don't know what do you, what you call it? larval therapy. Is that what we're calling it now? Oh yeah, so, maggot sterile maggot yeah. therapy. Yeah. So so talk about that one. How did how did we start using that? And um, yeah, well, I mean, I um, I mean, you know, that, that's been used for you know a very long time. I mean, the Mayans used it. Um, you know, it was an old treatment you know, back in the Civil War and, and for generations and generations. But, uh, yeah, I noticed they were using it. I was watching it. I was sitting home one day watching a show on the Discovery Channel, watching them in, out, of, uh, out of Great Britain. They were treating uh, um, diabetic patients with non-healing foot ulcers, and they were using uh, larval therapy. And I, was, and I was sitting, you know, on my couch watching that. I was like, wow, I could, I could really use that on some of my foot cases. And I remember that was early 2000s when I, you know, that might have been 2002 or so when I, when I saw that. And, uh, Right away, I got on the phone the next day, and I started calling. You really, I really, there's no internet, or I wasn't really Googling back then. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I started calling universities, entomology departments, and finally came across the uh, University of California in Irvine. I came across a Dr. Sherman who used, uh, he was raising larval and maggot therapy for use in humans. And uh, I got in contact with him, and he was, he was kind of excited about me using them on horses, and I got my first batch, and I used them, <laughs> I, and I put them quickly. Put them in the first uh, non-healing foot infection I came across, and the horse did did beautifully. Did really well. It was funny because I, I was actually afraid to use them. Yeah, I was, you know, Kentucky's pretty traditional, and yeah, you know, I was a young podiatry guy, and I remember the first farm I used them at. I I told him it was special medicine. I didn't tell him it was maggots, <laughs> and because uh, this was a case that was uh, it was a very good broodmare, and she had a, a really bad foot infection. Just nobody can get it to heal up. It's been debrided multiple times. It was different types of antibiotic concoctions put in there, and she was starting to founder on the other foot because we couldn't get this one foot infection healed. And and that's the mare I put him in. She was a very good mare. She had multiple uh, grade one stakes winners and a couple of her, a couple of her uh, offspring or stallions, and it healed that mare. And I remember when I put them in the first day, I told them it was special medicine, and I didn't, I didn't uh, tell them it was maggots. <laughs> and I remember doing the first bandage change. I'm trying to change the bandage without them seeing, and these maggots are falling out. And I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> but uh, you know, eventually I told them I put maggots in there, and they thought it was great. But you know, now they're pretty commonly used in, yep. in Kentucky and in mo a lot of different types of foot infections. Yeah. They're very, very useful. 
One of the most surprising things of that story is you had enough time to sit and watch television yeah. and see the Discovery Channel because you'd have to be one of the hardest working guys that I know. Another thing you actually bring in there about knowledge that sort of was lost and sort of came round again, for me, what I do, right, I see all these horses have got bad colitis, have got bad pneumonias, and um, cryotherapy, as we call it, or icing. Mm. Now, you talk to the old guys, just go stand the horse in the river. And when I first got to this country and started doing the medicine thing late 90s, it was all about putting nitroglycerine on the digital vessel and yep. everybody was very much against this, oh, it causes ischemia, shutting the blood supply down by making them cold. And yet now that's probably one of the most impactful things that we do. So walk us through cryotherapy, why it was in, why it was out, and why it's back again. Yeah. I think probably in the old days it was in because they probably noticed it was mostly you know, palliative. You know, the horses probably felt good, you know, standing in a you know, cool creek with the mud, giving them foot support. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, some horses got better with that. They probably didn't do it as diligently and as, as strictly as we do it now. I mean, now there's research showing that cryotherapy used consistently for, you know, 72 hours in near freezing water, around 5 degrees Celsius, has a uh, protective effect in the early prodromal stages of laminitis. So, you know, before a horse starts showing foot signs, when they're at high risk of developing laminitis, we start icing them. And that can prevent or significantly decrease the pathology that occurs when they do get, if they do get laminitis. And, and, and there's some evidence showing if you do it in the acute phase, when the horse just starts to show foot pain, that's the definition of the acute phase, they start getting a pulse and start getting a little bit foot sore. If you ice those horses as well, there's some evidence showing that might be uh, effective as far as uh, decreasing the damage that's done. But back to Peter's first statement, is there, is there a time that it's contraindicated? For icing? Yeah. Matt, I think it helps mostly with the, uh, the horses with like systemic inflammatory, you know, mm -hmm. like, like the infected uteruses or pneumonia or colitis. I think, I think those are the ones that seems to help the most. I, there's no evidence showing that it would help with uh, like a supporting limb laminitis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that might be an ischemic event. So when horses are fully weight bearing on one foot, you can do look at perfusion studies. Um, when they're fully bearing weight on one leg, there's very little blood flow, particularly to the lamina and the toe. And it's... Um, that, that, that's just a, an adaptive mechanism as horse. It's part of their shock absorbing mechanism. Probably too much to go into now. But when horses are fully weight bearing, there's very little blood flow to the lamina. Mm. So I, mean, I doubt uh, icing would help those horses. No evidence showing it would help those horses. You know, you've brought up a really interesting point because everybody seems to look at laminitis as laminitis as laminitis. But you've just sort of said basically there's differences. Cause so you could walk, could you walk us through how you understand the different sort of uh, precipitating events for laminitis, how the processes may be different, and whether you consider there's one unifying theory and, and one final pathway for horses that have laminitis that we could try to modify? Mm. That's a good question. No, there's multiple different ways horses can get laminitis. So you have this, this delicate tissue that holds the coffin bone to the hoof wall. And, you know, that, that tissue can be insulted many ways. I mean, one way is you decrease blood supply to it. You know, all tissue needs blood, blood supply. That's one way of, um, of compromising that tissue. So supporting limb laminitis, like we talked about, is one, that's one pathway they can get laminitis. You know, the one is the, uh, like horses with a major infection or inflammation somewhere else in their body. You know, that, that's a different type of laminitis. So where the, where, where the laminar are getting plenty of blood flow, they're probably getting insulted by some turn on of some enzymatic or destructive uh, enzymatic activity. So metalloproteinases is one of the things we hear about. And there's some unknown mechanism with horses that have systemic inflammatory disease. Uh, the metalloproteinases in their lamina will get turned on kind of in an unregulated way and it'll basically just melt down the lamina. They'll just let go and let loose. And those are scary cases because those tend to be, they happen fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Like they can, they can rotate or sink within hours. You know, some, it, it, they're not all, they don't all read the book. Some could be days, but it can happen very quickly. It's like a meltdown of the lamina. Those are scary cases. And then there's the, uh, you know, the third call would be the endocrine kind of cases, the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, or the Cushing's horses. And that's probably a different, again, it's probably a third different way that those lamina get compromised. Mm -hmm. You know, th those horses could be, uh, you know, they have a, High insulin levels. High insulin levels could have uh, effects on the endothelium of the vasculature of the of the uh, lamina. That's one way. You know, so it may affect blood flow to the lamina. Um, there's also high insulin levels also maybe affect the way the basal cells of the lamina communicate with each other, and they can you know, they they can kind of reproduce in a very unorganized way and create a lamellar wedge. 
you know, it's kind of this hyper proliferation of dysfunctional tissue. So those horses are a little bit more like in, insidious and they, they're a little more slow onset. You know, that those kind of happen slowly over time. It's not like you may notice them just being sore one day, but the, but the process has been going on usually for, I'd say, weeks, months, sometimes years, and just slowly reaches a point where they get sore. Yeah. So, so those laminitis cases are really tough. And when I watched you first start with this, I, I had experience with a few laminitis mares, and they were hard to watch because we didn't save all of them. We saved more yeah. now. But yeah. how did you deal with the – because for me, that was emotionally taxing – as a veterinarian dealing mm. with, with a laminitis horse, knowing when to stop, when the kindest thing to do is stop. Can you talk about your progression with that, how you dealt with that emotionally, and um, has your, have your thoughts and your approach to that changed over the last 20 years? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, how we deal, I mean, laminitis is a very painful disease, very painful process, and it can be difficult to, to you know, to, to see those horses sometimes. You know, a couple things that helped me, mentally is is uh you know knowing first of all you can't force horses to heal you can only help them to heal you know so i used to take every foundered horse i lost and just carry it on my shoulder for years and years and years until i realized you know we just we don't really we don't make horses heal we kind of help them heal so some of it's you know some of it's some other forces involved besides just us and then um the other thing is, you know, pain is part of the rehabilitation process. That's kind of hard to swallow sometimes. But, you know, anytime we get hurt, pain is part of our body telling us we need to, you know, take care of that tissue and not overload it. So, you know, pain is part of the rehabilitation process as long as they're healing. So, you know, pain plus healing, rehabilitation. You know, if you have pain with no signs of healing, that's suffering probably, you know. Gotcha. So that, that's something I, uh, that helps me in my mind. So... What that leads us to to do is, you know, how do we monitor these horses and and determine whether they're healing or whether they're not healing, and we're just making them suffer. And that and that's you know that's that takes experience. That takes a lot of diagnostic modalities or things we can use like, you know, radiographs and venograms, and and sometimes you gotta have, just have a lot of experience and a lot of numbers under your belt to look for signs of healing. Sometimes signs of healing could be difficult to detect to detect. So. Gotcha. So, so you talked about some of the imaging modalities. What's what's different for you now? What do you have at your at your fingertips now that you didn't have, you know, that you have now in summer of twenty twenty one that you didn't have back in two thousand two? Yeah. yeah, I'd say the number one thing that's been helpful for us is digital radiography. You know, so that's number one. Um, number two, I'd say venograms. Venograms have become common and very helpful as long as you've know how to interpret them. Uh, other things, you know, the biological agents we use, stem cells, PRP, for, for laminitis in particular, and then, you know, other, other biological agents for other diseases as well. You know, so you know, digital radiography, just to go back, that was, you know, before, you know, you'd have a horse with laminitis. Someone, you know, they'd, uh, a veterinarian or a referring veterinarian would send you an x-ray of it, and, and you would... Uh, and you'd make a shoe and go shoe the horse and, and put it on. Some of those horses would get better, some wouldn't. You know, we would think, you know, horse has rotation. We we wedge them up, do things to unload the pull of the tendon, give them foot support. You know, some of those horses got better and some didn't. But I think over the years we've gotten really good at using digital radiography to, because um, it's so accessible now. We can we can put shoes on in a certain way, rather than just taking a foot and putting a shoe on cookbooking it this horse has this disease we put this shoe on now we do things radiographically aligning things and balancing things and and putting our shoe on in a certain way in relation to the position of the coffin bone so digital radiography has helped a lot with that i mean before when i first came here you know we were we were all we were developing our films and coming back to the clinic yeah i mean we'd, we'd shoot radiographs come back to the clinic and develop them and then you know doing a foundered horse like that was a bit tough you know i'd i'd, I'd shoe a horse I'd, I'd shoot a radiograph of it and I'd use that same radiograph when I came back a month later because you really couldn't go back to the clinic every single time. Mm. And I, I remember I used to carry a little spiral notebook with me with every foundered horse I did and all the radiographic measurements on there. I'd measure, I, mean, I still have the spiral notebook in my office, but I'd have every horse, every case I had, and I'd measure their, their palmar angle, their sole depth, and all these parameters, and I'd try to go back and next time and try to shoe the horse you know, according to those. But now I have digital radiography at my fingertips. I can shoot a picture before, I can put the shoe on, I can take another radiograph, check it. Yeah. I don't like it, I can tweak it. 
that, that's helped quite a bit. So, so we need that notebook to put in the in yeah. our museum right next to Dr. Rude's <laughs> yeah. Dr. El Camino. The, well, Dr. Riddle's El Camino and Dr. Rude's ultrasound yeah, machine that's, that's, right. that's bigger than the El Camino. Yeah. Yeah. Spiral yeah. notebook. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is this is an archive, man. This is this. Yeah, is, yeah. C- can you can you describe a venogram? What what that is and and how yeah. that helps you. And, and for those w- watching on the YouTube channel, we'll, we'll throw one of these, uh, p- a picture of one of these up so you can see it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so a venogram is where we, uh, we put a tourniquet on at the horse's fetlock, and we inject a radio-opaque you know, dye, basically, into the blood vessels of the horse's foot. So the dye, the material we use, it's, it's an iodinated, iodinated compound that we inject into the vessels of the foot, and then you shoot a radiograph, and it gives you an outline of all the blood vessels and all the perfusion to the horse's foot. So it's a lot more sensitive than just a plain radiograph for detecting compromised areas of the foot. So, you know, a lot of times you'll see venographic changes way before you see radiographic changes. Gotcha. And then when you have a horse with a bad venogram and you're treating it, sometimes you'll see the venogram improve before you see radiographic signs of improvement. Hmm. So it's just another degree of Helps sensitivity. Helps you a lot with prognosis. Continue. Prognosis, yep. How aggressive to be treating. Gotcha. Yep. Going back to the river, right? We talked about cryotherapy. Oh, yeah. and you talked about mud providing support, and you touched a little bit just before on sort of shoeing and support material. Walk, a, walk us through that sort of progression from shoeing to support material and talk about hoof casts because I can watch you guys put hoof casts on all day. They're such an artistic thing. They're very complex. Walk us through what the advantages of a hoof cast is if you need to get to that point. But what's the thought process that goes into a horse needing one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you know, when horses, we use hoof casts for some types of laminitis, particularly horses that are sinking. Like in their, you know, when you think of a horse with laminitis, most of us are familiar with a horse that rotates. The bone you know, pulls away from the toe of the hoof wall. Um, but there's also a horizontal plane laminitis. Horses can sink a little bit either to the medial quarter, because there's lamina that circumscribe the whole entire hoof. So they can sink to the medial quarter or lateral quarter, or they can just sink straight down as well. So, you know, that's, that's a tough, very tough disease to manage because um, if you back up to the horses that rotate, that's mostly, you know, the lamina and the toe are compromised, and it's the pull of the tendon that's pulling on the coffin bone that, that, that tears that lamina when it's compromised. And there are things you can do shoeing-wise to battle tension, so you're dealing with tension of the deep digital flexor tendon against the weakened lamina. And we do things like we elevate the heel, move the break over point back. All those things are addressed mostly to take uh, tension off the deep digital flexor tendon to unload that diseased lamina in the toe. But when they're sinking in the quarters, you're dealing just with the weight of the horse and gravity. So it's a very problematic, difficult thing to try to mechanically treat. Um, you really can't do much for gravity unless you're going to put the horse in a sling or, or force it to lie down to heal. Um, you know, those have their complications. Um, but the, the one thing that has helped us with these horses that have laminitis in the quarters is the foot cast. And that's because if you ever watch a foundered horse uh, walk, a lot of people always say, you know, he walks pretty good in the straightaway. Uh, once he gets going, he walks good. Um, but then when he turns, he's really sore. That's because that turning really twists and shears the lamina in the quarters. So, you know, it's my theory, horses that are sinking, they have some diseased lamina, and every time they twist and turn, it just propagates that tearing, you know, further around uh, and, and damages more lamina. You know, if, if you think of lamina like a fabric, they're basically sheets of fabric. And if you want to, if you want to tear fabric, you're not going to pull it straight apart. You know, you're going to rip it or shear it. Mm-hmm. That's what horses turning do. When they turn, they're shearing that fabric. So the foot cast, what we do, we put the foot cast on and we make a dome on the bottom of the foot cast. And to me, that makes the whole hoof kind of, when the horse turns and twists, the whole hoof kind of moves as a unit and they spin on that dome. And it helps take away some of the sheer force in the quarters is all it does. It doesn't, doesn't decrease any weight of the horse down on the leg. You know, the, the gravity's still there, but it does decrease the shear. And with horses with, you know, a certain amount of lamellar damage, you'll save them that way. I mean, if some horses are just complete meltdowns and their lamina are just letting go everywhere, it's not going to save them. You know, probably not much you can do to, to save them. When, but um, I think when they have a, 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 some degree of lamina damage in the quarters and heels, that, that foot cast is, is beneficial and effective for those. And we've saved several like that. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned about tension on the pedal bone. 
and trying to relieve tension with the deep digital flexor and with shoeing. Let's say that doesn't work mechanically. Where do you go? Yeah, well, mechanically, if, if they're rotating severely and they're, you know, they're, they're through their vasculature and they're through their sensitive corium, their, their dermis of the sole, uh, the next thing when shoeing mechanics fail would be a, a deep digital flexor tenotomy, you know, depending on the, the owner and the client and their goals. Uh, that, that's always an option. That's, that is very effective. Um, it's very effective at, obviously, it decreases tension on the tendon immediately if you cut it. Um, and then you've got to combine that with a special shoeing called a, a derotation or a realignment shoeing. And, and that can be very effective in treating some horses. You shift, basically when you cut the tendon and do that, you shift the weight from their toe all the way to their heel. Mm -hmm. You know, horses are toe loaders. You know, if you, do, if you put a horse on a pressure mat, their center of pressure is more like up towards the apex of the frog. You, you think you'd be back on the heel yeah. looking at them. But if you, if, you look at, if you put them on a pressure mat, they're right around the apex of the frog, maybe slightly behind it. And when you cut their tendon, you shift the center of pressure to further back in the foot. And, you know, it has complications, too, because like we talked about earlier, some horses have laminitis in their quarters and heels. So if you have a horse with that's rotating and you don't really know how healthy his lamin are in the quarters and heels and you do a tenotomy, you know, sometimes they can become a, start sinking a little bit in the medial or lateral quarter. So you're just shifting the load. You're not taking the load away. You're just shifting mm -hmm. it to a different area of the foot, and you've got to hope that that part of the foot holds up. There's a lot of art involved in that science. Yes. Yeah. That is a there, huge is a, judgment call. Yeah. There's a lot of complications that, that you know, and there are uh, a lot of things that have to be done correctly. There are little 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 elements in the in the details that can be a difference between success and failure. That's for sure. So, so Scott, you've you've solved a lot of problems, or you've you've helped us solve a lot of problems, and um, helped us manage things a lot different. What, what's what's on your mind now? What what problem is out there that you're working on that you think if I can just get here with this? What's what's next? Uh, to me, the most difficult thing has always been treating the low heeled foot. <laughs> you know, whether it's a racehorse or or uh, you know some other discipline. You know, treating a low heeled foot is always difficult. I always found, you know, treating, you know, different types of, you know, there's a good foot, there's an upright clubby foot, and, there's, and then there's a low heeled foot. A lot like we just talked about with laminitis, you know, the club foot's mostly tension. It's mostly a contracted flexor tendon that causes the club foot. So, and using different types of shoeing modalities, it's easier to treat tension than it is to treat the forces of gravity, you know. Yeah. So, and low heel, it's basically, you're battling the forces of gravity on a, on a confirmation that's making that horse load his heel. And that's a very difficult thing to, tr to try to treat. So you're just left with trying to, trying to help that horse grow the strongest, healthiest heel possible because you're not going to change his conformation. You think of a low-heeled horse, you know, long sloping pastern, maybe sloping shoulder. Um, you know, maybe you just can't help but load his heel the way he's built. So we're left with trying to just help that horse, you know, build a strong heel that can accommodate those forces. And that's using different types of shoeing modalities, again, support and um, gotcha. Taking stress off the heel in different ways. D d does the sole support have anything to do with those horses developing yeah. low heels? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, there's a, anytime you put a horseshoe on a horse's foot, just take a look at a fairly normal U-shaped horseshoe. Anytime you put a, that on a horse's foot, you kind of, you stress their heel. I mean, you do make them get a little bit lower in the heel, a little bit underrun in their heel. You know, the heels want to migrate forward. You know, so the horse that has the healthiest heel is usually a barefooted horse, you know, because the loading, um, the way that foot's loaded is the most natural. I mean, the frog is bearing weight, the bars are bearing weight, a little bit of the sole is bearing weight. When you put a horseshoe on a horse's foot, you make the perimeter hoof wall bear all the weight, and you deprive those axial structures in the middle of the foot from bearing weight, and you really can stress the heels and they can get lower and more underrun. So what we try to do is we try to Realizing that that barefoot horse has a nice healthy heel and we also realize some horses need shoes We try to mimic the barefoot condition the best we can with shoes So that's where sole support materials come in there are different density sole support materials just to help mimic that barefoot condition You know horses are probably meant to have their feet packed with mud be barefoot and that provides a lot of natural sole support and it uh So we try to mimic that with, with sole support materials and, and sometimes bar shoes or heart bar shoes to help, help the foot behave like a, like a normal, healthy, natural foot.
Gotcha. Because I think of it a little bit like my own shoes, right? They do make me perform better. I'm not as sensitive. And I think horses are a lot the same way. But at the same time, I don't go to bed with the same pair of shoes on and, and wear them for 30 days at a time. Yeah. So, so I think that's probably a lot lot the same for a It is a lot. Of horse. Yeah, a lot of our horses have to compete, sleep, rest, and, you know, eat in the same set of shoes. So yeah. I, mean, I do think somewhere down the road, particularly like in race horses and horses that have a lot of stress on their heel, I do think we'll have uh, – I envision somewhere down the road horses having like removable frog supports on their shoes or, or maybe removable, removable orthotics or something to give them some arch support while they're just standing around and resting. And then you can take that stuff off and compete. I think down the road that'll be you know, removable heart bar shoes or removable frog support devices would, mm. be, would be something that'll, I think someday will become fairly normal and commonly used. Maybe Under Armour will come up with the Morrison line or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, or yeah. the barber line of nighttime <laughs> shoes, because it sounds like you, you're not wearing the same shoes to bed, implying that you are wearing shoes to bed. <laughs> no, no, no. This, this is more than information yeah. I needed to know. Um, so, tell us, what does a day look like for Scott Morrison? Walk us through your day. Uh, my day. I uh, wake up about five thirty. I feed my dog, let my dog out, and then I get ready for to go to work. Sometimes my dog comes with me. Sometimes she stays home. I give her the option. Mm-hmm. So I don't expect the same out of everybody. I do that myself. <laughs> <laughs> and she does. She'll, she'll go outside, check the weather, and if it's hot, she won't go to work. <laughs> um, anyway, and then I, uh, I go to get a Starbucks. I got to start with a Starbucks or a strong coffee every morning, and then I'll go to my first farm call, usually around 7 o'clock. I try to be on my first farm. And it's, it's a mixture. I do farm calls, and I have in-house cases, so it's hard. We're running back and forth. And, you know, we have horses all, all over town. You know, we go from every side of Lexington. So, you know, 45-minute swing from each farm to the other sometimes. But I try to line things up where we can, you know, do things where all the farms I'm doing that day are close to each other. And it's coming back to the clinic, working on some horses that have hauled in. Um, the farm work mostly is uh, we do a lot of – we do everything, really. We do foals, yearlings. Uh, stallions, brood mares, just any kind of foot problems or conformational problems, um, emergencies, infections. You know, and then the, the surgeons we usually call sometime in the middle of the day with a, a lameness exam they worked up that may have uh, you know, either a foot lameness or a foot-related lameness or maybe a horse that just had an MRI the day before that needs some, spe- needs some attention. So we'll get pulled into the clinic a few times during the day. And then uh, usually around... Um, we, we try to wrap up around five or six or come into the clinic at five or six and look at our hospitalized patients around five or six. And then I try to get home around six o'clock at night and I try to ride one or two <laughs> horses every night. I, I do try to, I try to make sure I do something besides work and I do try to make sure I ride almost every night. So I enjoy doing that. Yeah, well, I'm guilty of getting you guys in about nine o'clock at night sometimes. Yeah, I, purpose, I purposely left out the medicine phone yeah, call that I get right. around, uh, twelve o'clock. <laughs> Saying it's in isolation and you have to come at the end yeah. of the day you can't, yeah. when all my other cases are done. But hey, we couldn't we couldn't do it without you. Yeah, yeah. So, what does the future hold for Scott Morrison? Ooh. I think I'll uh, be at Rudin Riddle doing podiatry for for a while. Probably, I don't know. 65, 70. Um, I'd like to, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just want to um, want to stay, you know, I want to stay active. I, I like to, you know, I like doing the work I do. I like, I like working as much as I, I, I like working almost as much as I do now. I'd like to someday maybe work a little bit less. I always joke. I say I work half the day because I love it. I work the second half of the day because I have to. <laughs> you know, so when I can get to where I work half of the day uh, and, just, you know, that, that, and then take off and, and do, do something else, that'd be nice. But I think I, I think I'll always be doing podiatry until uh, until I just can't anymore. Shoot till you drop. I think I'll shoot till I drop. Yeah. Do, do you have a Do you have a favorite case or an accomplishment that uh, that, that sticks out for you? God, I don't really have one in particular, to be honest. I mean, I have so many in years past, like, you know, and, and now just, you know, I mean, I, we get to work on a large array of different types of cases from the backyard horse to, you know, famous, famous horses. And, um, you know, sometimes the ones that stick out to me the most is just the, the backyard horse that someone hauled down here three hours away and, 
you know, the horse had bad laminitis and, and, and you treated it and the horse now has a fairly normal life and, and they're riding it again. I mean, those, those cases, you're always, uh, you just can't help to think about them, you know, every a couple of times a week, you know, which I'm wondering how they're, how they're doing now and, and, uh, you know, how lucky you were that you got to work on those horses. And then, you know, you work on the, the high level horses too, and they're, they're great and they're fun and, and they, they keep you motivated. Uh, but they have their own, you know, own, uh, level of stress associated with them mm, yeah. as well but I, I i get i get joy out of all of them i, mean, I like i like watching good race horses or good anything jumpers or, or western pleasure or western horses or i like watching horses compete after we've helped them i love i love that i mean that's i do like working on the athletes but then i like watching a horse that you know had a serious problem and now has a fairly normal life after we've treated them so i can't say there's one particular case yeah. now I, I get i get fired up about I like a lot of different cases. I, I like podiatry. I mean, it, it sounds probably very mundane, maybe, or maybe more boring to some people. You know, you're just working on feet all day long. How do you do that? But I see such variety in it, and I see a lot of different types of cases and a lot of different clients, a lot of horses that do a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, for me, it keeps me very motivated, and it still excites me. So I don't think I'll get above the fetlock anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to stay in the foot for a while. It still, it still fires me up. Still plenty to go there. Well, you know, no hoof, no horse, right? That's right. And so yeah. much of what we do is uh, dependent on what you do because if I, I might fix the primary problem, but if it's walking out of its feet, we're still lost. Yeah. So yeah, that's, a, that's a sad story when they overcome so much. And yeah. They, and then they got to... Yeah, and that's hard for us to watch too. So, we really appreciate what you guys do. No, and as a, as a practitioner who's who's dealing with something, it's so much it's so much better now that we can we can turn these things over to you guys and and have the expert care and and the advances that, that have been made are unreal. We're saving so many horses now that we weren't before you took this on. So it's it's very appreciated. Um, you and your entire group have done a lot for the horse. Yeah, and we're the lucky. industry. Yeah, we have a lot of good people work with us, so we're very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and you're really generous with your knowledge too. And, you know, it's made a big difference, not just yeah, in this absolutely. town, but everywhere. Everywhere yeah. you go, people talk about you guys because of how you've helped them out. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thanks for coming to see us today. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Right. Appreciate it. I think Thank it's you. been a great conversation. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So uh, that's stall side for today. We were talking to Dr. Scott Morrison, a podiatrist at Root and Riddle. See you next time. Veterinary Pharmacy is a full-service veterinary pharmacy located in the heart of the bluegrass, Lexington, Kentucky, the horse capital of the world. We are the official pharmacy of national recognized organizations like the Breeders' Cup, the National Horse Show, and the United States Hunter Jumper Association. As a full-service veterinary-only pharmacy, we offer a multitude of options in care of your patients, giving you and your clients a little peace of mind in certain times.